Welcome to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey of Kiss Organics. This is the podcast where we discuss the cutting edge of organic growing from a science-based perspective and draw on top experts from around the industry to share their wisdom and knowledge. Before starting off the podcast, I want to tell you about some exciting new stuff going on with Kiss Organics. We are now officially registered for our Soils and Nutrient Pack with the CDFA in California. We went through the process of registering as a fertilizer, which is how all super soils or living soils should be categorized. If you're using one that isn't registered that way, then it might not have the level of testing and lab work that you want to make sure the heavy metal levels and nutrient levels are safe or actually what the company is claiming. You can also view microscope work on our soil mix on our YouTube channel. In addition, we are approved for use in organic production with the CDFA, as well as certified kind in Oregon Till. We have our veggie mix certified with the WSDA and are in the process of getting the rest of our products registered as organic here in Washington as well. It's just a lot of paperwork. We hope to be adding some new hydro shops and garden centers in other states here soon, but don't hesitate to contact your local shop or have them reach out to us if you're interested. This week's podcast is a follow-up with our guest, Reggie Gaudino. Reggie is the Chief Science Officer for Steep Hill Labs. Dr. Gaudino oversees all scientific research and development for Steep Hill and is the driving force for Steep Hill's genetic research program. Dr. Gaudino directed a team of researchers which led to the development of GenKit, the first cannabis DNA-based sex test. The research from Dr. Gaudino has been peer-reviewed and published, leading to important new discoveries in the cannabis industry. Dr. Gaudino received his BS in molecular biology and PhD in molecular genetics from the State University of New York at Buffalo, and he conducted four years of postdoctoral research at Washington University in St. Louis, studying transcriptional regulation of rRNA. Reggie was one of the first African-American molecular biologists to enter a PhD program in the United States in 1985. Now on to the show. All right. Hey, Reggie, thanks for coming on the show again. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Ted. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm actually honored and surprised that you have me back. Oh, uh, the feedback from the show was really good. It was all really positive. Um, I did get a few questions. Um, if, if you don't mind, we'll just dive right in with some of those. Sounds great. Okay. So one of the things in the podcast that you had mentioned was that uh, you had worked at Monsanto and some people reached out to me really concerned about Monsanto in general. Could you elaborate a little more about what the future holds and the role of companies like Steep Hill? You know, for example, if you were to develop an effective genetic marker uh, with, with the data, what assurances do growers have that their data isn't going to be used by a company like yourself or other companies in this space and then uh, turned around and bought out by a company like Bayer who owns Monsanto? Uh, okay, so these are great questions. So, so let me start with so I did my postdoc at Washington University in, in St. Louis. And so some of my postdoctoral research was done in conjunction with Monsanto and on the Monsanto campus. I have actually not ever worked or been paid by Monsanto. So I, I want to make that very clear. So um, and then so to the rest of the question, you know, so um, data is an interesting thing. And so I get approached with this a lot. How, how do we know that you're not going to do this? Well, when you take an individual sample and you look at it all, and you sequence it, all you really have is um, that sample. And if that's the only sample you look at, you can't really make any calls about what else is going on in a genome. The power of genomics doesn't come until you have a lot of DNA sequences aggregated, and then you start to look at differences in the aggregated data. So when you look at it from that perspective, any one person's data is not going to give you any answers, right? It's not until you actually have tens or hundreds of samples to then align and or, uh, you know, number crunch against each other where you start to see patterns fall out of the ether, right? And so when somebody comes to me and says that, I, I say, well, your data point is just one of many. And with your one data point, you can't do much. It's the aggregation of all the data. So in reality, it's the work that we do on the back end after we've done all this other sequencing that allows us to make any calls and see any differences, right? So um, that's not to minimize, you know, the fact that growers spend a lot of time building unique cultivars, you know, but you can't tell it's unique from the genetic perspective unless you compare it to a bunch of other things. 
So having said that, you have to do the kind of analysis that they're afraid of to be able to see anything. And then you get to the point where, uh, and this has been litigated, you know, in regular, you know, chemistry type um, science and other sciences where, uh, in fact, there, there's a whole, um, a whole level of infringement payment analysis that's done based on the contribution of that one data point to the overall system, right? And if it takes a thousand points to be able to make a call, then the person's really only entitled to one one thousandth of the payment, right? And that's what happens right now in patent law, right? So getting back to the question, you know, um, it's important for people to understand that in order to be able to to, to give them any advice on breeding or markers, we have to be able to aggregate data and look at it as a whole, um, in which case any one data point becomes a lot less important, even though it's very important to the client, right? So, you know, we have to look at it from the both perspectives. So, um, you know, so what the pill has done, right, is we've done a lot of sequencing and, and we have, um, done a lot of aggregate. We've found markers for THC, CBD, you know, olivatolic acid, 55 different terpene genes, flowering genes, et cetera, right? So we have built a library of markers that we can then turn around and use to help people do better breeding. But again, we couldn't have done that without looking at everybody's data. So what we do is then we turn around and we offer that information to say, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the markers, right? We allow anybody who would like to breed for that marker to use our genetic services. We ourselves, and, and this is unique to California, right? And so, and we can go into examples of other companies that are not doing this, right? Um, but because of us, but where we are, we actually cannot hold any financial interest in any other license in California, right? So I cannot have a cultivation license, I can't have a dispensary license, I can't have a nursery license. So so all I can do at CPL is actually sequence and then offer marker assisted breeding services where people bring us their DNA. We do the analysis and say, hey, you have this allele, it's the right one or it's the wrong one. So if you would like to be able to breed, then this is what you have to do. So that's what we do. We offer consulting services based on the marker analysis and sequencing. Um, some other companies out there have taken some data, and, and, and I think this is you know, poignant, and I'm not trying to bash anybody, but right now there are um, companies out there that are under scrutiny because they have, in fact, taken their, their clients' data and, and used it for their own personal gain. So uh, I don't want to mention names or anything like that, but, but you know, it's, if people you know, look deep enough in the industry, they'll find exactly what I'm talking about. So, um, so the, the next part of this question is, is what happens if Bayer, um, you know, um, buys our data or absorbs me and buys my data. So what they don't do is, they, so they, they don't, uh, okay, before I go into that, let me, let me give something else, which is, I think, a basic misconception. In, in patent law, unless you are the inventor, you cannot file for a patent. If you do file for a patent and somebody challenge it, challenges it, it is basically thrown out almost immediately. It will cost a little money to prove it, but yes, it, it, they can't, they don't have a leg to stand on, right? So with those two things in mind, if Bayer were to come or Monsanto were to come and buy Steve Hill, right, they would get our marker database, yes, right? Because that marker database was something that we created as RIP based on sequencing thousands of strains, right? But again, we get back to the, any one strain doesn't tell you anything. Um, and, you know, and that would be of a concern because a Monsanto or a bear could, could then use all of that data to jump start, right? But it's not anything that someone else can do. I can offer that same breeding service to, you know, any number of seed companies in the cannabis industry now, and they could do the same thing, right? So, um, so the technology is there and being built for the cannabis industry to use. And because of the nature of that data, um, it doesn't allow anybody to patent their strain, but it does allow them to do the same breeding if they can get the same germplasm, which is a problem in the industry because what we do in the industry is we put clones in dispensaries anyway and sell them for 10 bucks a pop, right? So, so you know, I, I think we, 
we need to, as an industry, understand a little better where the lines are drawn in these things, right? So first of all, you can't patent somebody else's strain, right? If you try to and they can prove it, you're going to lose the patent, right? Um, you know, um, marker developing markers for breeding, right, can't be done just using one strain. It must be done with the aggregate data from a lot of strains, in which case, you know, what we've done now is removed from the strain. We've had to go and take a look at it and say, okay, why, why are these things different? Where do these differences occur and how, and how then can we follow them, right? So there's a lot of work that goes into that that is devoid of the person's personal DNA sequence for his strain. So, uh, you know, there, there, it's, it's a difficult thing to get comfortable with. And, and I think we're in a different situation in the cannabis industry because typically this stuff was all done by seed companies, you know, big seed companies that did it all in-house and did all the work that Steep Hill does in-house. Like Monsanto doesn't go to a Steep Hill to have them sequence their DNA. They, have, they do it all in-house, right? So, so I, you know, I, I do understand that there's this fear factor because I think a lot of the industry doesn't understand the power of genetics or what genetics can, can and cannot do. Um, but, you know, it, it, I, I don't think there's a way to assure people that something like that can't happen because they're absolutely right. You know, five years from now, 10 years from now, whoever the board of directors is at Steep Hill could say, holy crap, we just got offered a, a billion dollars for Steep Hill. Hell yeah, we're going to sell, in which case, they would get everything lock, stock, and barrel, including the IP. And so, you know, um, remotely, is that a concern? Yes. I, I think that we don't have to worry about that. I, I don't think the big blue chip stock people are ready to come into the industry anyway. It's, it'll be a couple of years. And that still gives us a couple of years to lay the foundation for which they can't do any of this, which is then we as an industry have to take the information that we have the genetic sequence has been developed by the companies like myself and MG, Medicinal Genomics and Phylos. We have to use those tools to our advantage so that we can put out patents and intellectual property that keep the people like from Monsanto from coming in and then benefiting from exactly what they're afraid of, buying a company like mine and then having all this information, right? So if the patents and the strains are already out there, it doesn't really help them all that much. They still have to work around all those things. Does, does that kind of address the question? I think so. So you're you're saying that any one person's genetic marker is really just a drop in the ocean. Uh, it doesn't have any intrinsic value uh, by itself, but when combined with a bunch of other data, it now has it has value because you can make correlations and draw conclusions. Now, what I would exactly. say to that though is, um, I have friends, for example that are vegetarian because they're very against our industrial uh, meat process, which I completely understand and it makes a lot of sense. So they abstain from that fully knowing that they're, they're abstaining from eating meat is probably not going to affect the overall American market for uh, meat consumption. But if for them, it's an ethical principle. And I, I see that around uh, growers too with cannabis. So is there any, is there any way though to use these tools to use this science without um, without risking or this sort of thing? Or is it really one of those things that if you want to use this technology, it's just something that you have to risk with, with, your, uh, with your genetics? So there is a way to use it. So, so not everybody has to get their whole genome sequenced, right? So when I, when I speak of marker tests, we don't sequence the whole genome to, to look at the markers. We've developed high throughput assays that have the ability to just look at that one marker. So let's say somebody sends in a, you know, a sample to us and they, they just want CBD and sex. That's all we look for, right? Because we're only charging him 30 bucks. I'm not going to go and spend, you know, a thousand dollars to sequence his own whole genome to give him the answer he's looking for when I can do it for 30 bucks. Um, th so th does that sample um, stay in the repository for future work? No, yes and no. So what the way we do it is, is, um, we, we, uh, if we, if we see in the course of working with a client that we have something special from that client, we will de definitely then try to engage them in a fuller investigation of the genomics. Right. But again, um, we're, we're in this to 
create a business. And a, the business is most efficiently done by just looking for the markers people check off on the box. Right. So, um, you know, uh, I, I, at the end of the day, I'm trying to make money. And if I do additional work, I'm losing money because I'm not charging a lot for the service in the first place. Right. So if I'm charging 15 or, or 20 bucks a marker, that's really, really cheap. Right. Um, you know, you look at looking marker analysis in human genomes, it costs thousands and thousands of dollars. Right. So, um, you know, so, so in order to participate using these tools, you have to have a relationship and a trust with the lab, right? Or maybe you, you go to a lab like mine where we are precluded from doing anything that you're afraid of, right? So, uh, you know, if you go to a lab in Oregon where they're not precluded, or you go to a lab, let's say in Arkansas, where they, you know, who knows what, what lab is offering these services, but if you go to another lab where they have the ability to, you know, breed and create their own, you know, germplasm, well, then there is clearly a potential for conflict of interest. And, and I'm very sensitive to that because of the fact that, um, you know, I myself am a plant biologist and have worked for 22 years in intellectual property. So I am very, very sensitive to the, to the plight of the person who is potentially going down this path, right? So I spent 22 years writing patents and protecting patents for other people. So when we put together our service, it was from the perspective of we do not want to be a competitor. We want to be a partner, right? If people, we will never have people trust us if we turn around and start breeding ourselves. So that is something that we absolutely do not do with detail. So, um, but it is a concern and people need to do their own due diligence to see, you know, and, and read the intake form, right? So every, every genetic service out there has a in, intake form contract read the fine print, you know, see what they're going to do. I specifically state that I get, I have the right to use the data for aggregate analysis, but I, and I clearly state that I will, that I, that I make no claims to the, to the, to the strain or, to, or to the DNA itself. I will not go out and try and patent your DNA because it's not my DNA for the reasons why I said before. So all those things are stated in my intake form. Um, but I clearly state you, you're bringing me your data. I'm going to give you a result. And I'm going to use this data for further aggregate research. So I'm, you know, so it, it's important for people to, I think, you know, read the fine print and make sure they do their due diligence before choosing a genetic partner. Yeah, that's uh, you brought up a good point. That's a red flag for me, to, or I guess more of a sore spot because, uh, like my father, for example, he he originally um, was designed and made a compost tea brewer. This is like. 20 years ago. And he was working with a particular lab who was collecting all this data. He was paying them for these tests. And then, you know, they were recommending his brewer because of the level he was testing. And then down the road, you know, five, six years, they came out with their own line of compost tea brewers. So they took that data and that information that they gathered from my father and others who were using their lab to gain this information and then came out with a competing product, which you're right. It's not illegal, but ethically and morally, it's a little bit suspect. Um, and that would be my concern as a grower. Uh, what you mentioned there is in states like Oregon, uh, where they, they could do something like that. And, and you, I've have heard exactly what you're alluding to. Uh, that would concern me to know that my data is being used to essentially help out a competitor in my own state, in my industry. Um, so th that's a, that's a very valid concern. Yeah, no, it, it, it absolutely is, right? And, and so, but at the same time, right? So, you know, without the ability to aggregate data and to see differences, let, let's take the Varens, THCV, right? So, so um, if you just look at DNA from a, a Varen strain, right? You have no idea what makes it a Varen strain. It's not until you compare it to a non-Varen strain and you can see the points of difference that you can tell why a Varen strain is, is, is special. And then it's only after that analysis on a much larger scale can you actually reasonably make calls as to what markers might be useful for breeding to follow producing varin strains, right? So, um, you know, so at some point there has to be an acceptance in the industry for at least a basic level of genetic investigation and, and, and utility, right? Because without it, we will always be behind the eight ball. This is exactly what is done in every other commercial crash crop. And again, we do things a little bit differently here because a lot of this work is done internally to a big company, like a Monsanto or a Dow. They do it all internally. 
none of the companies in the cannabis industry, at least beginning, had the resources to do this. I'm sure that there are some big C companies now that are doing quite well, you know, selling, you know, millions and millions of dollars a year of flour. That's great. So some of these labs can then start to do it, but then it's an expensive undertaking, right? So now you have to start thinking about, you know, sequencing all your strains and, you know, the setting up a molecular biology lab. And then, and then once you have your strain sequence, if you don't have a method developed for using that information, you're still, you know, at square one, right? So it, it takes a lot of work to be able to set up a robust genetic service um, a lot more than people would probably realize, right? And so because of that, it's not something that you can bring in-house unless you are a very large company or you have the money like behind an Anandi, uh, sorry, um, an Aurora or a Canopy, right? People with that kind of money can, do, can consider this path internally. Otherwise, it, it has to be done through the use of a third, of a third party. Can I ask you a, a random, slightly off-topic question here? Uh, you continually use the word strain. As a geneticist, um, is, there, is there a particular reason you use that nomenclature over varietal or um, cultivar? Um, I, because of the industry itself, cultivar or, and actually cultivar is probably not even uh, correct. Chemovar is the actual correct terminology, right? Because you can take the same genetics and grow it multiple different ways and get different chemical outputs. So realistically, we should be, we should, and this is the problem with strain names in general. Right? So, because it tells you really nothing, even the genetics tells you nothing without knowing the environment in which it was grown. So chemovar is actually probably the, the most accurate terminology for the industry. For what your, the data you're collecting now, wh yeah. what would be the yeah. best if we were to refer to an actual, um, plant a plant it would be a varietal then wouldn't it be because it could be expressed into different kinovars but it would be a, a specific yeah original so genetic guess, material yeah so uh cultivar varietal i think cultivar and varietal are, are fairly close in in their meaning so i i think you know i i see that more people are adopting varietal um and getting away from the from the names from the strain designation and, and i'd say that varietal is definitely a step in the right direction and potentially varietal with a subclassification of a specific chemo bar right so this varietal uh, the this chemo bar from this varietal right so and because remember it, it, there is also the possibility that you could have different varietals that have overlapping chemo bars right so um, so ultimately, it depends on what, what question you're asking. If you're really concerned about just the chemistry, then, you, then it would be a chemovar. But if you are concerned about the genetics, it would be varietal. And then with a designation of the chemovar uh, output you're looking for, which then designates some environmental you know, boundary. Okay, that helps. I, it was just a question that someone had asked me, and uh, I thought I'd pose it to you. Uh, so uh, changing topics one more time. You, you mentioned a little bit some numbers and a little bit around uh, Steep Hill in terms of the testing. What what sorts of markers are you currently able to test for? I know you me mentioned sex. Um, you mentioned THCV. Yeah, so we have, um, so we, we've had, a, a, obviously, the sex and the CBD tests have been available from us uh, for, since 2015. Um, we have expanded the CBD test so that it now tells us specifically we can identify those that are 20 to one or higher. Um, we actually have expanded our, you know, our cannabinoid testing. Uh, we have the, uh, a gene for CBGA synthase. It's not really called that. It's called aromatic parental transferase, but nobody understands that. So we call it CBGA synthase. Um, uh, we have a marker for that. We have a marker for the upstream. We have uh, markers for geraniol pyrophosphate synthase, which is, uh, or at least one of the subunits, which is one of the feeders into making GP, uh, um, CBGA. We have the other side as well, the olivitalic uh, acid spikelase and, um, or uh, olivitalic acid synthase, depending on whether you use the new or the old nomenclature. Uh, so those two things are key to making the compounds that are then condensed into CBGA. So we have those. We're going further back up that stream. Uh, on each side, although those are uh, less well developed, we have mapped 55 active terpene genes. Uh, we are uh, in the final phases of um, putting together the the 
uh, validation that would allow us to be able to call each of those 55 individually. That's a tough job because there's so much similarity in the terpene gene, but we're getting closer on that. Um, uh, and I, as far as the cannabinoids, I realized I just, I, I didn't finish that thought. So we also now have developed uh, a bunch of THCA markers that when used in conjunction with CBD markers actually allows us to start to get a handle on different ratios other than the 20 to one, right? So now we, we think we have markers that when you combine the marker test, they identify those things that come out like two to one, like, you know, five, you know, four to one, 10 to one, that kind of thing. So, so um, then on top of that, we have, we have started looking at um, all the fatty acyl synthases, because again, those are involved in oil production, right? And, and those are uh, cross over into hemp as well, same genes. So, you know, so oil production in general is, is it becoming a more important thing. So we've started down that pathway. We, we have a number of fatty acyl synthase genes that are involved in hydrocarbon production. Um, so uh, we have the flowering genes, the clock genes, so things like, you know, photoperiod, uh, um, things that affect trichome development. So those are all in either in validation or in the works. But the ones that are available right now are sex, all the cannabinoid ones uh, that I mentioned, and then uh, many of the terpene ones. So the, the other ones are, are in earlier stages, stages of development. So if I was a breeder and I wanted to go through this process with Steep Hill, uh, and you mentioned some costs around you know 15 to $30 for a particular marker. I would just come in, fill out this form, and select what markers were most important to me. And then I would submit what I assume is a, a leaf tissue sample. Ah, uh, yeah. So that so it used to be that way. Um, so what we so first of all, um, you you wouldn't have to come in. We we actually you can actually do it online or, or through phone call. So you know what what we recommend though, is it depending on on the person's, um, you know, comfortableness with with genetics in general, right? So. Um, a lot of times we'll get people who don't really know how to start. And so that we do an initial consultation, which is free. So we just get on a call. We ask you what your goals are. What are you trying to breed for? What are your starting germ plasm? You know? um, and then you know, we, we get an idea of that, and then we can suggest how to go about it. But it, it no longer is leaf-based because that's illegal. And you can't ship across state lines. Um, so we now use a, um, a card from uh, GE uh, Healthcare. It's called, it's called the FTA Plant Saver Card. So the beautiful thing about this card is that, um, you know, you can do a leaf print on it. We can get DNA off of it. It carries a very small amount of cannabinoids because it's, it's designed for DNA. Um, and, and so we, we have different processes that we we recommend right so there's a way that you can send us the card um where a small enough leaf print will not have enough cannabinoid to be a problem and so we can actually do some limited cannabinoid ratio analysis so the card does not capture the chemistry in a quantitative fashion but it does in a qualitative fashion so let's say you have a two to one cbd to thc ratio we will see that ratio preserved in what comes off the card in terms of the cannabinoids, but we can't tell you that it was 20%, right? Because it doesn't, it doesn't capture, you know, uh, quantitatively, just qualitatively, right? So, um, but then that allows us to do a little bit extra analysis for you because now we can do the, the CBD THC, you know, genes and then say, and, and here, and based on what we got off the card, it looks like that you have a two to one ratio and it's supported by the, the DNA, right? So, um, and let me, let me take an aside right here. So until somebody has a perfectly true breeding stabilized strain, DNA just represents a potential. That's a really important concept for people to understand, right? Because very few genes or very few outcomes are due to a single gene, right? So like THCA synthase, makes THC, right? But there's a whole feeder pathway that feeds the THC synthase. So if something upstream of the gene is not optimized, you may never see the benefit of having the best THC gene in your plant. Does that make sense? Totally. So, so what you're saying is it, a lot of it, it just tells you the genetic potential of that plant. So if you took that plant, planted it in cocoa and then grew it very poorly or under poor lighting conditions or watering, you may not get that result um, that you were looking for. Exactly. Right. So, so, but 
that gets that becomes less and less of a concern as you go through your breeding program and you've optimized all of the genes that are important for the effects that you're looking for. And that's the beauty of what we do. As I said, that's why we're going back up the pathway. That's why we're looking at the GPP and the lipidolic acid synthase, because this way, as the library expands, you actually can breed and select for the optimized plant that you're looking for. And the beauty of genetics is you can select for these things all together, right? So, so you know, for instance, let's say you're, you're looking for a terpenaline dominant, THD dominant, uh, you know, strain that you know um, is drought resistant. Well, uh, drought resistance is something that we're working on as well as as, as are many stress stressors, right? So, there's a lot of stress response in cannabis, and so we're looking at some of those as well. Um, and so, you know, once you have the markers. You can do a breeding, you know, crack a thousand seeds and pull out the five that have the markers that you want, because that's the power of what the library and the, the, the marker assisted breeding gives you. you. You don't need to grow all thousand. We can just find at germination the five that were the ones that had the, the things that you were looking for, toss the rest and just work on those five, right? So, so, so um, as this technology becomes more mature, it actually provides greater benefit for the, for the real savvy genetic, you know, breeder, right? So the, the, because now it's not just pheno hunting, right? You're not just going out there and, and rubbing stems and smelling your fingers, right? So it's actually intelligently designed breeding programs based on markers that are known and can be followed. And that's what the Monsantos and the Dows do, right? So that's how we take our industry to that level right without like having them do it for us sure but the one question i have then is you mentioned popping a thousand seeds and then doing the marker testing you know a thousand fifteen dollar markers alone would be 15 grand um if you start looking at more markers how, how does this become affordable well um so you know what we we do offer bulk pricing, right? And on both the number of tests and uh, like any company, you're going to end up bulk pricing. So if, if somebody comes in and they want two tests done, it's $15 a test, right? If they want two tests done for a hundred, for a hundred samples, the price goes down, right? So, so there are bulk, there are bulk pricing, you know, uh, um, you know, opportunities. And, and then there's actually, you know, different relationships and different companies do this differently. But, but, you know, at some point, if you're looking for a large enough, um, a, a large enough swath of, of markers, then we would probably, you know, try to recommend that you join the breeding program, which is different, involves some sequencing, and allows us to do a little bit more in-depth analysis uh, that costs more upfront but saves money and time later. Right. So, you know, so so it's also important to understand that. <clears throat> Genetic services come in at, at many different levels, right? There's a very simple, basic analysis where you can do sex tests and stuff like that. Um, and then there's, you know, analysis where as you go down a breeding program, when you're trying to understand how stabilized your strain is, right, for any given marker, where you actually do need to do sequencing along the way um, in the breeding program to, to understand what's called the heterozygosity homozygosity index, right? So the more homozygous you are at many positions, the more closer you are to stabilize and true breeding, which is ultimately what we need to be if we want, would like to go towards, you know, stable seeds, right? Um, and so genetic services themselves come in, you know, like bronze, silver, and gold kind of levels tiering, right? So, um, and, and again, a, a good genetic partner is not going to try to sell you the gold or platinum service all the time if they can get you the answer at the bronze level, right? And, and so that's why we started with the single marker test, right? So that people could jump in and play around very inexpensively and get to understand. And, and it's, it's been, you know, pretty uh, good for a number of companies. That, you know, so we've had a number of seed companies that um, in Northern California that spent you know, a few tens of thousands of dollars with, with us, you know, over the course of two years. And then we, and to be quite honest, we've never seen them again, right? So um, MTG Seeds, so they, they'd probably be upset if I said their name, but I did anyway. Um, they came to us a few years back. We helped them 
uh, with our high CBD test. They came back the second uh, following year to do a follow-up. They established um, um, their their germplasm for their high CDB strains. We haven't seen them since. It's been two years since I've seen anybody from MTG seeds. But we were able to get them to a point where they had a stable population of CBD plants that were they were used for germplasm, right? So, so it it doesn't always have to be very expensive. But even though it is a fair bit of money up front at a thousand seeds at fifteen bucks a pop, even though it would probably be closer to like eight or nine bucks a pop, right? So, um, you know, it, it, it still um, you know ends up becoming a savings down the line because now think of all the time and money you have saved from not having to do pheno hunting on thousands of seeds. So, you know, it seems, so there's no way around it. The money has to be spent, but that money is almost always recouped and fairly rapidly on the back end when you end up being able to streamline your process. Sure. So you're, you're cutting out the growing process, which costs money and labor, especially. I know um, even just a couple seasons ago for my father growing some outdoor plants, uh, we had, you know, we were growing from, from seeds and had, uh, had a couple males sneak through that I didn't catch till later on. So I grew them a lot bigger than I would have, uh, you know, I invested more time and energy and nutrients into plants I didn't have to. And, and 15 bucks would have been a bargain at that point, uh, in terms of my labor and stuff. So. Well, that, that's, that's it. So, but here's the beautiful thing too. So, so, you know, Stability is this thing that is an amorphous term in the genetic in genetics in in, um, in cannabis, right? But so if you if you pop seeds, right, and as soon as you get to let's say the second node, you 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 do a leaf print of one of the leaves, you send it in, right? Um, that's you're you're a week in maybe, right? And so you get the answers back in less than a week, right, or about a week or less, right? And then. And sometimes, and it depends on the, on the time of the season, right? So here's the problem: everybody waits for the last second, and then I get I get like forty thousand tests dumped on me in two weeks, as opposed to you know people starting early. <laughs> so, um, but you know the turnaround time is definitely dependent on what time of the year it is and how many people waited to, to very late. Um, but what ends up happening is if you do it early enough, you actually have time to go back and cull, right, and then even replant new seed. So. Theoretically, you should get, you could be able to increase your female population by at least 25%, right? So think about that. And, and because you're only two weeks in, most plants in that first two-week period, they'll catch up. You, you, they won't be that by, far behind when it comes time to harvest, right? So especially outdoors. You know, so you actually end up increasing your population of females relative to just cracking seeds and not doing this, right? So that you end up with a higher yield on the front end, right? <clears throat> you also save all that resource that, you know, however, four or five, six weeks till you, you can figure out it's a male, right? So um, you save all those resources, right? And, and so now, you know, you, you've, you've made some gains right there alone. Now, here's the beautiful thing. Because you can do it so early, and if you're not worried about growing for flower, but really just breeding... Now you have a foot tall plant or a two foot tall plant. You don't need to grow it full. You force flower, you, you pollinate it with your chosen pollen and you start the cycle over again. And now you're, you're really only two or three months in. So now you go from one generation a year or maybe two generations a year to five or six generations a year. And so now making stable seeds doesn't take 10 years. It takes two or three years, right? So so these are the benefits that people don't realize that you get with the ability to follow traits very early on because you don't get a whole plant to know you got it right. Yeah. So my takeaway is that even if you're not uh, interested in breeding necessarily as a grower, some of these tools can still be accessible and beneficial for you down the road. Absolutely. You know, just the time and resource management that you get out of being able to do this is, you know, but again, this is if you grow from seed, right? Not everybody grows from seed. So for those who grow from seed, this is a, a very beneficial early entry into genetics, right? Just t sex tests. And then if you're, if, you, if you're interested in just growing, let's say, CBD, you do sex tests and CBD, and you out of a random bag of seeds, and that, that CBD test identifies, you know, what your highest THC CBD or the highest CBD THC ratio will be. So now you, you, you've got all this information that, you know, you you would have needed 
a fairly long time to be able to discern otherwise. Now I want to I want to talk a little bit about stress. So you mentioned plant stress in terms of uh, water and drought tolerance. Now, as you know, when a plant is stressed, it it can change or produce you know higher higher levels of uh, THC and things like that. You always hear the story of the person who had their, you know, had everything go wrong with their equipment on a cycle and grew the, you know, not, a, not as well yielding, but some of the best quality, uh, cannabis that they'd ever grown. Um, in terms of stress, I guess I have two questions. One, do we have any research that you've seen around, uh, controlling that stress response in, in a plant as it, as it moves towards seed or move towards, um, senescence? And then two, uh, in terms of stress itself, is there any evidence going from, you know, successional clones that you can see a genetic change over, you know, over successive generations with a, a large stressor in there at some point during the plant's life? So, um, okay. So, um, let me ask the answer to the second question first. And the answer to that is yes. So epigenetics is a change in the DNA that is caused by environmental perturbations. Typically, it, it occurs by methylation of DNA. Uh, sometimes it's not methylation. Sometimes there are, there are other addicts that are added to DNA, um, you know, other, other groups. Methyl is a, is, a, is a CHD group, right? So, um, and so um, there, in, in, in response to environmental stressors, you know, things are turned off and or turned on, and the stress leaves a, a, a discernible footprint on the DNA. We see that by treating the DNA two different ways in sequencing. We take the DNA from the plant, we sequence it straight, or we treat it with something called bisulfite. And then we, after bisulfite treatment, we sequence it. And then because of that, bisulfite causes certain modified nucleotides to change. And so we can see where these addicts were added in the, the, the DNA uh, based on stress. Okay, so, so the answer is yes. Stressors do affect the DNA, and, and, and epigenetically, they are inheritable. So you will see the offspring of those stressed plants carrying that signature as well. And I think that uh, they've seen it go out as many as five or six generations in plants, and sometimes even in mice. If you stress mice, you get the same thing. So, so, and it, so this, this phenomenon, epigenetic phenomenon, is not just unique to plants. It happens in all organisms. So getting to the first question. so. Um, a lot of this kind of research is just happening. Remember, so we, we haven't had a, a lot of research dollars for cannabis. So, but what I will say is that I was at a, a conference just recently at, uh, in Colorado, um, at Provo, Colorado. It was the International Cannabis Research uh, Organization. And um, so we have some presentations where somebody went around and they were looking at stressors. One of the stressors was designed to mimic like insects eating leaves. So they went around with a hole punch and they hole punched uh, the leaves of cannabis, different amounts of holes on different cannabis to see whether or not they could see a difference in the response. And sure enough, they were able to see an increase in, in cannabinoid and certain terpene production, right? Uh, when, they, when they punched holes and the more holes they punched seemed the higher the response up to a level, right? So it didn't, it didn't double it or anything, but you could definitely see um, that there was an increase in expression. And this increase in ex expression is seen at, at the transcription level. So the RNA, which then more RNA usually means more enzyme, okay? Um, so the RNA shot up in response to this, to this nibbling stress, the hole punch, right? Um, at the same conference, people did something similar with, uh, you know, drought stress, you know, overwatering, underwatering. And they found that, you know, drought stress does, in fact, increase cannabinoid production. But I think, uh, I'm, maybe I shouldn't say this because I, I don't remember this 100%, but I think they actually found that overwatering had some effect as well. But I, I don't remember what that effect was. But, um, but yeah, so, but the problem is, is that, you know, there's really no facility that did this before. We, we have a few universities like in Colorado that are just starting to look at some of these things. And I've been getting a, I've been getting a lot of questions from, um, from breeders and cultivators about this. And so we have actually entered into some, you know, collaborative work with some of our partners where they're doing these things and we're looking at the RNA analysis and we're giving them, you know, the chemical results. So it's, 
it's a very interesting and, and pertinent and timely question, but unfortunately we are at the very beginning of getting answers to that. Yeah. And I want to caution listeners too. There's a lot of uh, variability associated with this, you know, as we start changing a varietal or a cultivar or, or an environment that can change the results someone would get. And also you're opening yourself up to greater risk of disease uh, when you, <laughs> when you stress a plant uh, at any level. So absolutely. So, so I do not, so let me just say, I do not recommend going around with a hole punch and punching holes in the leaves in your cannabis plants, because what you have just done is opened it up for invasion from bacteria, mold, and potentially even viruses. If you're growing, and this is something else that we should, you know, that is kind of this, it's in the back of everybody's mind, but we don't really talk about it because we haven't really hit true agronomic proportions, right? So by that, I mean, we're not doing, you know, tens of thousands of acres of, of corn, right? But, but now that the hemp bill is changing and, and, and people are becoming more accepting and the stigma is going away, we will see that we are going to have loud, large outdoor hemp and or cannabis growth. And so then we will have stepped into a completely other unknown area for cannabis that has plagued the agronomic sector, sector for, for decades, which is, you know, you know, plant pathogens that are not bacterial or, or, you know, fungal. There are all sorts of nasty viruses out there that love to predate plants, right? So people are starting to ask questions about the tobacco mosaic virus. Well, you know, and, and it's close relative hemp, sun, hun, blah, 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 hemp sunspot virus, right? So, which is also a mosaic virus. And here's something that's even more disturbing. Mosaic viruses tobacco mosaic virus, cauliflower mosaic virus, cucumber mosaic virus, et cetera, et cetera. They're all fairly closely related. And it doesn't take long from one for, for one type to exist and be passaged on another plant for that it to become a hemp russet mosaic virus, right? So, um, so as we get to larger and larger scales, we will start to see all sorts of things that we haven't even started to approach yet in this industry. Yeah. Have you seen anything around, uh, powdery mildew? I know there's some companies making tests for powdery mildew. What, what can you elaborate for people that are curious about how to, you know, how to protect against that? So, um, so yeah, so powdery mildew, again, you know, disease resistance in general. Um, but powdery mildew is, uh, particularly problematic for us, right? Um, a number of companies, uh, and we're associated with one pathogen DX. We, we do a lot of their development work. We we did we isolated powdery mildew from a number of different strains around the United States from our labs. We sent it out for sequencing with them, and and so we have a powdery mildew test uh, that we have that we make available through um, pathogen DX. Medicinal Genomics has one. <clears throat> um, so powdery mildew is interesting because it's actually usually a a combination of of two or more organism, organisms, so, so, but one of them is always kind of the same, right? So there seems to be one common organism in all types of powdery mildew. Um, and so th those tests are, are, are out there. They are fairly accurate. I would say that, you know, if you get a hit for powdery mildew in one of those tests, you should, you should assume you have powdery mildew. Um, you know, it, 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 the test itself is fairly robust. The way those tests work, like with any other uh, identification test, is um, ribosomal RNA, which is uh, something. This is it's like biology 101. Uh, ribosomal RNA is what um, makes protein. Oh, sorry, is the, is part of the structure that makes protein. Okay, uh, the thing called the ribosome. The ribosome, you know, chugs along the RNA transcript and spits out protein. So the thing is, is that um, you know. In the ribosomal RNA of any organism, there are there is a unique signature that is unique to that organism. So we've used the what is called the ITS1 and ITS2 regions of ribosomal RNA to be able to identify organisms. So, um, and so it's a very accurate methodology. It's been around for decades, and 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 that's what we used to pull out the DNA from powdery mildew and identify it. So that's why I say if you get a hit, it's probably real. Um, but, but then, you know, the question that that's an after the fact thing, right? So, or it allows you to actually screen clones. If you're buying clones, getting a powdery mildew test is a really good idea, 
a really good idea because um, powdery mildew may, in fact, uh, I think, you know, people, some people say it does, some people say it doesn't, but powdery mildew may, in fact, become inter interstitial, which means that it goes into the cell spaces. And even though you don't see it on the surface, it may come out later, right? So, so by doing the DNA-based testing or the microbiome testing of a clone, you will identify if it's been exposed to that, right? So, um, but on the other hand, there are some very simple ways to prevent powdery mildew, right? So good ventilation, you know, uh, don't, not too much humidity. And when you start to see that little white <clears throat> kind of discoloration on a leaf, you hit it with pH, you know, 9.5 or higher water, right? Alkaline water kills it dead. So, um, so th there are ways to actually, you know, prevent it from happening. And there are ways to screen to keep it out of your grow if you go the clone route. Typically seeds, you know, seeds don't carry powdery mildew. It's, a, it's something that happens from, you know, growing conditions later. Sure. I, I guess approaching it from a growing perspective, um, environment does play a huge role, but how much of those, the particular uh, fungal sp spores or, or strains that you're seeing there, how, how are those, um, how ubiquitous are those in nature, I guess, is my question. So what is the risk of just airborne spores coming into your grow? Or are these specifically being brought over? Is it more like a hemp russet mite of the fungal world where we're passing it on humans or passing it on plant material? Wow, that's a great question. And, and you know what? I don't have an answer for that because <laughs> well, I've, I've okay. never thought about it from that perspective. I've never thought. So I do know that there are strains that are more or less resistant to powdery mildew, right? So um, LA Confidential is one of them, right? Where um, it, it's extremely, extremely sensitive to powdery mildew, right? So, so because of strain or cultivar genetics, there are differences in the ability or the susceptibility to powdery mildew. So that much we know, whether or not it is airborne or carried by insects or other organisms, I cannot answer, but I will be more than happy to look that up and get back to you on that. Sure. Well, I know like just from a, as a vegetable farmer, I know that these I, powdery mildew being a catch all for anything that produces any fungal strain that produces that, uh, you know, white powdery looking material on, on a leaf surface. So you're, when you mentioned that it's more than one organism, I thought that was really important for people to realize um, and it may be different here in Washington state than it is in California or Maine. But my concern is, for example, I'm working specifically with a grower that's battling powdery mildew at the moment. Yes, he could go get one of those tests, but we're fairly confident that the test is just going to come back as a positive. So it's not useful because of how much powdery mildew he's, he's already battling. Now, he has plants in that room that are more resistant to it. But if powdery mildew is systemic or interstitial, as you're saying, then by reusing those plants in the room with new genetics, is he potentially contaminating all of his new genetics and, and just repeating the cycle? Um, that's yeah, yeah, kind of the way I'm looking absolutely. at it. Absolutely. No, no. So that's, that's, you're absolutely right. So if, if it is, so that, and that's why I said, so getting the powdery mildew test, you know, um, you know, it is, is important, right? Because um, you can, if you do it on the leaf or, or bud, right, you're going to see it. But if you, if you do, let's say, a, a stem, you know, you, you send a, a stem, a piece of stem or a stem print in. Um, so theoretically, that's going to be more of the internal, you know, biology. And if you see it in a leaf, uh, sorry, in a stem, you know, uh, section, I would say that you know it's interstitial. If, you, if you're looking at flower or leaf, it's hard to tell if it's interstitial, but if you look at the stem itself, and a lot of these tests that I'm talking about, you don't have to do it on the leaf. You don't have to do it on the, on the, on the bud, right? You can actually do it on any piece of plant that has DNA, so the stem, the root, anything, right? So, um, so if, you, if you were to be concerned about whether it was interstitial or not, uh, or just surface, you could send both a leaf and, let's say, a stem, have them tested independently. And then if you get one has it, one doesn't, you know, you know where you are. And that's kind of where I was saying it's good to test your clones, right? Because clones in general, um, you know, at that age, you're not going to see if you, if you see it on the clone before you buy it, you shouldn't buy it, right? But, if, but you're not going to see it on most clones. So when you do it on the clone, right, what we do is we, we wash the surface, 
right on a clone so that you know anything that it would have been just surface is gone and then we and then we look at um you know the you know what's left right and so and we recommend the same thing to to our customers as well if they're looking to to, to screen clones you take your clone you you dip it um in a little alkaline water you know and then do the leaf print after that and then the dna that's inside is the dna that's inside right? and then we can tell what's inside so yeah, I just wonder, though, if some of these environments, um, if because of the amount of airborne spores pressure that people will get um, in an area, you know, like up here in Washington, for example, um, when we get those big humidity fluctuations, we're pretty much seeing powdery mildew, you know, whether we grow from seed or from, um, you know, growing from clone o outdoor and indoor without a sealed room. I think it's something that um, you're going to battle. So I'm just wondering if if there's going to be genetic markers for PM resistance here in the near future. So, oh, so, okay. So uh, if that's where you were going, I'm, I completely missed that question. But yes, actually, so it's interesting. So a lot of what we know about disease resistance actually comes from other organisms like Arabidopsis and Brassica. Um, so Arabidopsis is stale crest, the little cute little plant that doesn't get more than a few inches tall. Um, brassica is the family that gives us things like cauliflower, um, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, that kind of thing. So we've done a lot of work in those organisms and we've actually gotten a lot of disease resistance understanding from those organisms. And believe it or not, in, in Arabidopsis, there's actually, there are trichome mutations in Arabidopsis that cause powdery mildew resistance, right? So, so we've actually gone down the path of looking exactly for those genes. And so when I, when I, you know, I said we were going to, you know, looking at disease markers and that kind of thing. It was just, um, you know, um, stressors, right? So, um, so what we've done is, so uh, the, the genes involved are called triticon and, and glabrous, right? And there's a few other ones. Um, and so when you look at mutations in, in those genes in Arabidopsis, they cause, you know, a, a more or less sensitivity to powdery mildew. So we've actually started to look for the equivalent genes in cannabis to see whether or not we can identify those genes and then start to look at things like OG Kush and the Lake Confidential, which seem to be the extremes of powdery mildew, one's more resistant, one's more susceptible, and, and, and to start to look at things like that so we can see, and this gets back to what I was saying earlier, how you have to go about doing these genetic analysis. You got to take one of each, so one doesn't give you any information. You have to have the extremes of the system so that you can find out where they're different. And so that's where we are right now, uh, looking at different strains that we know have different susceptibilities in these various genes that we know from other plants are involved in powdery mildew resistance. That makes sense. So you're, you're, you're still collecting data on it. And, you know, once you get a thousand plants that all the growers all said had, you know, good powdery mildew resistance, you'll start to see similarities and then you can eventually develop a marker. Exactly. But as of right now, what we have is, you know, a marker for the organism that causes it. So we can tell you if it's there, right? Now we're working on trying to tell you how to keep it from coming through good breeding and good genetics. Yes, exactly. And would the same apply to botrytis or bud rot? Um, yeah. So, so every, you know, every organism is going to have, um, you know, based on the chemistry of the plant, right? And, 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 and some of these things may not be uh, specifically, you know, like a trichome related, it may actually be some of these things are related to the chemistry itself, right? So maybe there's a combination of terpenes that is uh, more detrimental to bud rot or botrytis than others, right? So, um, and, you know, botrytis is interesting because botrytis usually comes um, along with predation from other things, right? So um, caterpillars in particular, when, you know, when caterpillars are eating your your plant and they poop on your plant, then wherever they've eaten and pooped is where you get botrytis, right? So there's definitely either a link to the caterpillar or there's a link to the wounding of the caterpillar, right? That it still has to be worked out. But, um, you know, and, but every single one of these stresses or diseases or pests are, will be investigated because that's the nature of agronomics, right? We've done all the same things in all these other organisms. That's why we have genetically modified corn and whatnot that is, you know, designed to be able to survive uh, the use of certain pesticides so that we can kill off the insects that are killing them, right? So, um, 
you know, and we will, we will, you know, obviously I don't think we'll ever get to that point in cannabis because we, we have a, a different mindset in this industry, right? We're not like big ag where pesticides, you know, don't matter. Um, you know, but I, I think, you know, people have to understand it. It, it's the same kind of process, right? It takes time to be able to work some of these things out because without being able to find, you know, a spectrum to look at genetically, there's no way to go after some of these markers and tell you what it is that's causing it, right? So some of this work is kind of slow. Some of it we get lucky and it falls out because they've done it already in another plant. And then we can just take that and it plugs right in, right? But cannabis, unfortunately, you know, we get some information, but what we've found overall is that many of the gene families that are present in other plants, while we find the gene families in cannabis, we find that they are highly diverged in some cases. So it, it's a little bit slow going, um, but, you know, but I, I'd say that the low hanging fruit, I, I'm not sure botrytis, you know, I, I know we, I, we have a marker to identify botrytis, but, you know, botrytis is one of those things where until we understand the actual root of infection, it's hard to come up with a marker, especially because if it's, if it's carried by another organism, then, um, then it, it's something more difficult to determine what is the resistance, right? Um, because it's not, a, it's not a direct one-to-one correlation. Unlike where powdery mildew, it was a one-to-one correlation. A, a defect in the trichome caused powdery mildew not to be able to, to, to colonize, right? So that's a one-to-one correlation. So. That makes sense. So as a grower, what should I get excited about on a t- if I get a test back from you guys, like uh, I, I know, I think it was you or one of the other people at Emerald Cup on that panel mentioned that Mercine was sort of the dominant thing you guys were seeing on all these, and then you started seeing some other genetic diversity show up on the terpene side. Um, you, you know, you discovered THCV. What as a grower, what should what would make my plant stand out and be like, hey, this is something special? Um, so right now, um, you know. Any plant that's making an abundance of a minor cannabinoid or making more than the average minor cannabinoid, let's say THCV, you know, it exists at a point, you know, 0.5%. Most places, Durban poison makes up to 2%, da, 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 right? So, so uh, but that goes with CBC, you know, CBG, any of the minor cannabinoids, if you find, um, you know, you pop a seed and you, you, you do a chemical test and something like that pops up, or you find, um, a minor terpene that is now very abundant. So, so you mentioned myrcene. Myrcene uh, is uh, dominant in almost two thirds of all cannabis strains, right? The other one third of cannabis strains is populated with alpha pinene dominant, um, limonene dominant, terpenaline dominant, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, um, and so fi- if you find strains that are not myrcene dominant and then, or in one of those other, um, you know, terpene categories, already you have found something a little special, right? So like a Jack Herrera is special for a reason, right? Because it does, it's a terpenaline dominant strain. There are not a lot of them. Um, and then, and then um, you know, I, I guess it really depends on, on what the cultivator or breeder's goal is. But, you know, if, if the goal is to produce better terpenes and or um, more cannabinoids, that's a, that's a very, very important thing moving forward, right? So we all want, you know, more cannabinoids, be- better yield of the important compounds from the least amount of biomass, right? So looking for things that increase, you know, if you find, if you have, uh, you pop a bunch of uh, seeds and all of them have a certain amount of biomass at week two, but you have one that's got like four times the biomass, right? Or two times the biomass. Clearly, there's a mutation there that is increasing the overall vegetative production, which means that overall things are working better. Those are the kind of things that people should be interested in. If it looks different, if it smells different, that's usually a good indication that you have something special and that you should pay attention to that. So I think if if it were me, I would be excited for anything that doesn't look normal, right? And, And, you know, be willing to do a little chemical or genetic investigation to see why it doesn't look normal because you, you don't know. You, you may have the next hot thing, right? Which is exactly what happened with THCV. The, the guy came in, had a bunch of strains. He was looking for CBD. He did a cross. He did a self of Harlequin. 
uh, for Doug, this is for Doug's Baron. He did a stuff of Harlequin, and then uh, lo and behold, a bunch of stuff was high CBD, and we had one weird thing that was THCP dominant, you know, to high THCP. Um, you know, and so uh, because he did come in and say, hey, I want to know what my highest, you know, my, my highest, you know, CBD producer is and all this other stuff. Um, so we ran an extended cannabinoid profile from, and, and, and we were shocked. You're we like, holy crap, we've never seen that before. Um, told him about it and he was off to the races. So, so I think, you know, it's, it's important to invest the time and money and energy into, into identifying things that don't look like you expect, because that's where the real diversity and innovation is going to come from. Because if we're all growing, you know, platinum cookies, it's all going to look the same, right? So, and if we're all looking for that perfect bud, we're going to end up locked into genetics that don't change much, right? So it's really those things that are the outliers that lead us to new places. So that's what excites me anyway. So. Yeah. So we need growers to, to, if they do see something unique, to go ahead and get it um, looked at so that we can preserve those genetics over time beyond just continually pulling cuttings off of a mother plant and, and, and find out if it really is that special outlier like you found before. That's, that's great. Um, well, Reggie, uh, you know, I, I feel like I could talk to you all day, <laughs> but I know you're, you're a busy man. Uh, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Um, you really kind of opened my eyes to a lot of this potential of genetic testing and, and understanding better what the science looks like behind it. So it's not so intimidating. Well, you know, you know, again, anything new is tends to be scary, right? And, and and I completely get, you know, some of the criticisms because you know, you know, we 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 have been kind of a shunned society. We had to go underground, and now you know, um, now we have things that look like big ag being thrown in our face, right? And it's like, well, how do I know that this is not really big big ag in dis in disguise? And it's a very valid point, right? And, and, you know, the only thing I can say to that is, you know, it's about integrity and trust. And I think, you know, and, and I, I just gave a seminar in Baltimore a couple of days ago about how laboratories and producers tend to be at odds with each other, right? And, and a lot of times it's because of the way regulations are written or, or um, you know, a lack of explanation of the process, right? And so, you know, I, I would encourage anybody who's even, you know, close to thinking about this, don't be afraid to call up a lab and say, hey, I want to know what happens. I want to know how you do it. I want to know how much it costs, you know? You know, what does it, you tell me what I get out of this. They, and a, and a good laboratory with a good program should be able to answer all those questions. And if they can't, then you, you have your answer. That's not the right laboratory. Yeah, people definitely do their due diligence around laboratories too. I think that's another important thing, but that would be a whole nother podcast, <laughs> I feel like. Yeah, yeah. there you go. So. All right, thanks, Reggie. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, Ted. It was, it was great talking to you, and, and uh, thank you once again for letting me ramble on on your show. So. Now, before I sign off, I want to tell you about some bonus content at the end of this track. We chatted a bit more off air and I found the content really interesting, so I'm including it at the end of this podcast. But that was Dr. Reggie Gaudino and you are listening to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'd like to thank everyone who has supported the podcast by leaving me a five-star rating and review on whatever platform you listen on or by supporting the Patreon account. Really appreciate it. You can also check out the website where I put up a ton of information and also offer a wide variety of organic amendments, soils, and other gardening products at www.kisorganics.com. Thanks for listening. Now stay tuned for the bonus track. I did have one random question that I was going to ask, but I didn't want to make the podcast too long. Uh, what's so great about cookies from a chemical perspective? It, it's a not fun plant to grow. It's pretty finicky. It's a low producer. Um. It's it's a terpene profile, really. Uh, you know, because it doesn't make it doesn't make any more THC than anything else. Uh, but it does have it is very robust in this terpene production. Cookies tends to be you know two to three percent terpene content, which is pretty good for most high THC producing strains these days. A lot of high THC producing strains don't really make a lot of terpenes. Um, but you know, but again, you know, we we get into a cultivator thing right because i've seen people who grow cookies 
and they bring it in for testing and it's got no terpenes. It's dry as bone, right? So, so you know, there's definitely an art to this whole thing about, and, and culti- I mean, and curing and ha- post-harvest handling is as important as the growing part. And I think some people new to the industry don't understand that, right? They're like, oh, dude, I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to blast out, you know, 100,000 square feet of, of, of bud. I'm like, okay, great. But how is your bud going to come out? you know, on the, on the post harvesting side. Right. So, and it's a shame because I've seen some really beautiful bud that, that had THC and not a lot of terpenes and it didn't get me any higher than something that didn't look as good that had a lot of terpenes. Right. So, um, so in my opinion, you know, cookies is not that great a strain it's and you're right. It's hard. To, and here's the thing, right? So both cookie fam and DJ short, right? So they both had a strategy where they went after the weirdest looking shit <laughs> or, or, or the, or the finickiest shit to go after. Right. Um, and, and, and you're right. So cookies does not grow well, especially outdoors. Right. So, um, and, and here's the, the, the dirty secret about our industry, Ted, the majority of things that we find interesting would be outcompeted in the wild. Many of the strains that we find really good would probably not be very successful in the wild. And so, so we've created this kind of weird, you know, industry where, you know, problematic, hard to, to grow and, and process things are what we find is our, our goal. But, you know, you look at things like, you know, cookies, cookies, so Blue Dream, some of these strains, you're going to see fields and fields and fields of, blue, of some of these strains. But things like LA Confidential cookies, you're not going to be able to, you're not going to see a thousand acre field of that stuff being grown because it's going to be really hard for them to, to get quality product like that because it doesn't grow well outdoors. So are you seeing a difference across um, in terms of uh, THC and, and terpene expression across different methods of growing? Like... Uh, we're a big promoter of outdoor living soils, and I feel like we're seeing higher levels of, of uh, cannabinoids and terpene pr- that profiles with growers that are switching over. Are you seeing that on your end too? Yeah, so we see a lot of environmental perturbation the data. So, um, in, you know, we have we have clients who did you know studies with just lights. Um, so, so, so interestingly enough, some of the of the larger uh, cultivation you know companies now are doing a lot of decent science like so one of them that we work with came in and said okay we want to optimize our grow but we're going to start with lights so we want to pick the best lights i'm like well you realize that if you pick the best lights now and you change your system later you 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 know you're growing other methodology that you may um you you may end up seeing that it wasn't the best lights i said so you should be prepared for an, an iterative process start with lights, we find out what the best lights was. And they were looking for something that gave the best combination of chirps and cannabinoids, which happens to be LED plus UV, right? They did HPS, HPS plus UV, LED, LED plus UV, same genetics, four different rooms, right? The only thing they changed was the light. And we got the data back and it was the LED plus UV gave the best overall, you know, median of both terpene and cannabinoids, right? Uh, HPS, by itself was highest peak um, uh, cannabinoids. LED by itself was the highest peak terpenes, right? So, um, and then, so then they took that data, the LED plus UV, and now they're going back into their nutrients, right? And then, and, and living soils. So they're doing that kind of work now, but that's a lot of work and a lot of money, right? And so it's only really the larger cultivators that are starting to get into that, but we are seeing very interesting differences and it is, it's the real thing for sure. Well, in my head too, I'm thinking of all the methodology challenges and isolating a variable, you know, across cultivars, across all these other environmental things. Um, I, I could see where it would just become a big mess and you could draw some broad conclusions for that facility, but it, it would be challenging. Um, but that's interesting. So in my opinion, and we're seeing better terpene and cannabinoid expression in living soils because of those microbial interactions, the plant and the, and the microbe microbes in the soil are really controlling that. And that's more than we can do with these hydroponic nutrients. Um, so, so since you're a living soil guy, I'll, I'll give you this. So we haven't published this data yet. We're, it's in a, it's in a paper that we're submitting. So I'm going to swear you to secrecy, but so you will <laughs> okay. get a kick out of this. Um, 
which is that we just did a, a terpene RNA expression analysis for a number of different plants. And so what that allows us to do is to look at the uh, abundance of, of RNA produced for different terpenes. And we did it in a way that we looked at it from a, um, a temporal and a spatial perspective, right? So we did um, roots, uh, shoots, leaves, tree flower, mid flower, and just before harvest, right? And then we took the RNA from all of those things, right? And what we saw was um, that there are about 10 terpenes that are expressed nowhere but the root, right? Hmm. And, it ha- and it happens to be that they're all monoterpenes with the exception of two, which were sesquiterpenes. So basically the lighter, more volatile ones. So clearly these 10 terpenes are there expressly for communication with the environment, right? So it is, it, their job is to attract what is good and repel what is bad. So you are absolutely right. Living soil is a thing, and we, we already know that there, in, that there are chemicals that cannabis makes that is, makes nowhere else but the roots so that it must be involved in communication with the soil microbiome. Ooh, can I have you back on to talk about that when uh, you publish? Okay. Cool. Not a problem. I'll let you know. All right. I won't, uh, I'll, I'll delete all that off the thing. So, but that's, <laughs> well, I, I appreciate I mean, you sharing. I mean, uh, I, I, actually, you know what? So we've shown the preliminary data in a slide deck at a conference. Uh, oh, yeah. In fact, it was shown at that, at that Colorado conference that I just talked about. So technically it has been released. So you actually probably could talk about, it. you don't have to erase it if you don't want to. I could share this with listeners. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll, yeah. uh, I'll, I'll, edit up a little bit of this last part of our conversation and throw it on as a little bonus part. I'm sure people will be really thrilled by that. Cool. All right. Hey, uh, thanks Reggie. Thanks again, man. I really appreciate it. Hey, no problem. It's been fun. All right. Have a wonderful day. You too. Take care. Bye. Bye.